16, so we started talking about RAID. The thing to remember is that there's three primary types of RAID, which is redundant array of inexpensive disks. There's striping, mirroring, and parity, right? Striping, mirroring, and parity. Uh, just remember that JBOD, just a bunch of disks, is not a solution. Uh, if you do this and you lose just one of the physical disks, then you lose all of the data that's stored on the set. So there's no redundancy, there's no performance gain, there's no um, parity, there's no safeties. All you're doing is stitching stuff together. In RAID, what you're doing is taking a set of physical disks and then you're overlaying a fake logical disk. So for example, if this was a RAID zero disk set, with terabyte hard drives, all four together would be striped or RAID zero as it's called. And that would mean that there's a fake disk that's four terabytes large because it stitches these four together, okay? And that's, that's the important thing to understand. Um, so, yep, let's keep going, all right. Why do you do this? Well, um, the most important thing is you gain performance and you gain redundance um, and resilience. So, so in simple terms, there's a very strong reason why you do it. Um, you get a much better reliability in terms of your file system and you get much better performance. And there are hardware solutions and software solutions for RAID. The hardware is always the better way to go. So the thing that I want you to understand is that the hardware is always the way to go. In this picture, it's showing a physical disk of 100 gigabytes and a physical disk of 100 gigabytes. And it shows how when you work RAID, you're mapping this logical disk on top of it and you have a logical disk that's 200 gigabytes large. Any questions so far? No. Okay. Uh, let me check one thing real quick. So, yeah, capacity, All right? So you get more disk space, you get reliable disk space and you get performance. There's actually a third one. So it's not just reliability and performance, it's also capacity, okay? So, Let's remember that there's a third reason why you do this. JBot is a terrible idea. Don't ever do it. Don't ever do it. Don't ever do it. Okay. Okay. Um, here we go. All right. So <clears throat> there is a uh, logical block addressing or LBA. You'll see references to that uh, at times, um, but Basically with RAID, you're, you're using a dedicated controller to do that. Um, here, you know, this slide's talking about the redundancy, the reliability issues. Um, when you have larger disks, basically you have an efficiency so that when you're deduplicating, so what do we mean by deduplication? In file servers, what often happens is that people have multiple copies of the same file. Have you ever seen that happen on your own hard disk? Maybe? No. No. Well, so if you, um, if you decrease the number of file copies that improves space efficiency and a lot of operating systems have a backup method that includes deduplication. <clears throat> RAID volumes allow you much larger space so you can manage that. You have to basically identify each of the copies of the cells and then, or the files, and then you have to eliminate the, the copies. And that takes a lot of disk space. So, so, you know, one of the benefits of RAID too, though, is that there's redundancy. However, the redundancy that's gained 
is structured or framed in a different manner. So it actually improves, you know, performance. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, uh, there's a lot of slides here that aren't as important. Um, you do need to know the different RAID levels and this slide series falls short of the best version of them all and that's kind of a disappointment, but, and let me see if that's a little bigger. That's a little easier to see, yes? Yeah, that's better. <laughs> So reads and writes, <clears throat> one of the things that we want to differentiate when we talk about RAID is how certain types of RAID are better for reading or better for writing or both. And when we talk about striping, RAID zero, what we're doing is taking alternate chunks of data and putting them on different disks when we stripe. So that, you know, when you do this in mass across the physical disks, what it looks like is that you have, you have all of these um, chunks of alternating data from the whole file, basically. So one analogy is you have a movie and you put the first half of the movie on disk zero and the first half of the movie on disk one. And when you need to read it into Netflix to deliver it to someone, disc zero and disc one deliver first half and second half of the movie and they get stitched together. So they're working in tandem. Another way to think of this RAID zero striping is tandem disc sets where they're reading and writing. The highest performance of all comes from RAID zero. The only problem is, is that you have half your data on one disc and half your data on the other disc. Do you have a whole movie if you lose either disc? No, you don't. No. You don't. You have no redundancy, right? You don't have any redundancy. Now, the uh, videos that I put out there in the resources folder might be quicker and easier with some of these definitions, but I wanted to make sure we covered everything. So they have examples of the different disks and they talk about chunk size. You don't have to know about that. And they, they analyze uh, the performance of uh, RAID 0. You don't have to worry about that. But you do want to know about RAID mirroring. This is RAID 1, it's called mirror, mirrored disks. So we have the three types, striped, mirrored, and parity. The mirroring is actually good for reading data. So you have some performance improvements, but most importantly, you have redundancy. Writing is slower. Here is why. If I have a data file with logical blocks 0, 1, 2, 3, when I use a RAID 1 mirror disk set, that means I have the disks paired. Um, and and I, I want to tell you that that's one of the keys to RAID 1. RAID 1 involves disk pairing or quadrupling, it has to be multiples of two. You have to have even numbers of disks to do RAID 1. You have to have even numbers of disks to do RAID 1. And the other thing I want to tell you about that they don't mention in this slide series, and it, you know, it's kind of disappointing, there's a couple of things they really botch. If you have a RAID set, like if you have a RAID 0 set, it's very important to have extras of the same brand model and capacity of disk. So if you're gonna form a disk set, if you're gonna do uh, this, you want to make sure they're all Seagate drives and they're all, or they're all cheated drives and they all have the same spin rate and they're all, they're all identical down to the model number, right? So you want them to be identical drives and that's one thing they don't mention. I mean, you can do RAID otherwise and have bigger disks, and, but then you waste the rest of the disk on that, the, the capacity on that disk. It's not a good thing. So they don't go into any of that. They don't explain any of that. In industry, they don't explain that it's a good idea, regardless of which RAID you use, to keep extras of the same physical disk on hand up front before you set up a RAID array 
because two years later when the first disc fails, that model is no longer available. And then you don't have the same size, same capacity, same speed, same memory cache, same performance standards. And then the RAID controller has a hard time negotiating a replacement. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but I want you to know about that, okay? All right, so we were talking about RAID 1. RAID 1 mirroring improves performance on the reads because you can read back in tandem from both disks. What am I saying? You have two copies of the same file. So when you're reading it back out, this one can read out sector or logical block zero and two, and this disk can read out one and three, and the RAID controller can double the performance of disk reads but writing is half the performance because you have to take the original file and store not one, but two copies. There's two write operations to separate physical disks when you're writing data. So writing performance is cut in half. Reading performance is doubled if it's set for that, if it's set in tandem. The most important benefit of RAID 1, however, is redundancy. So if you lo lose the physical disk here, you don't care. Your RAID controller says, hey, you just lost your disk zero, the first disk. You might want to replace it. And if you did buy the same brand model and capacity, exactly, because you said, <coughs> I'm doing RAID as a computer science professional and I had CSE 410 with Professor Ken Top and he's a certified systems engineer and this is how it's done. Then you walk over to the shelf because you already bought spares and you slide the old disc out, right? It's called hot swapping. It's a little lever. The server continues running. You never have to shut it down. You slide the tray out, remove the bad drive, put the good drive you had the foresight to buy and you argued with your chief financial officer and told them in no uncertain terms that you were not a cheap date. You're a professional. You're going to do things right or you're not going to do them at all. So put more money in the budget. I don't care what you see for a price on this raid set. I'm building this raid the professional way. And I know it's a four disc raid, but we need six discs because we need two hot spares, right? Talk about hot spares in a minute. Hot spares are when you have an extra disc and it's actually just sitting there and it's plugged in all ready to go. And when this one fails, the hot spare just spins right up, copies the data over from the good one. And this one flashes red. And when you're a system admin walking into a data center, you see a flashy little red light and you're like, oh, thank God I bought those extra discs. And then you pull that one out. You take the extra, extra cold spare off the shelf. You swap it out in the carriage. You put it in there and you go home at five o'clock. You have a life. You can have dates. You can even have time for children. I know I'm being melodramatic here, but this is a big deal. So I hope you're getting it. And it's probably not in any YouTube video, is it? I'm hoping one of you says yes because you actually saw the YouTube video I took the time and trouble to put out there already. There will be questions on your assessment from the YouTube video and from this. Any questions before we continue on with the parody version of RAID, the poor cousin version of RAID, the redheaded stepchild version of RAID, RAID 5, what you do when you can't talk your chief financial officer into doing what's right. Uh, any questions about RAID 1? No questions. Okay, by the way, it is recommended that you use RAID 1 disk sets for servers that are mission critical. If you have a file server, if you have a web server, if you have a domain controller, if you have a DNS server, if you have any server in, in the enterprise where you need to, it needs to be bulletproof, your operating system volume, drive letter C, where you install the operating system should be a RAID 1 mirror with a hot spare. Always, always, always. Okay, any questions? RAID 4 disks, they talk about parity. Don't even pay attention to RAID 4. I don't know why they even go into that. Uh, they do talk about crashing, and this is significant. So sometimes when RAID disks crash, uh, sometimes it's because there are problems with the reads and writes before the disk sets can get identical copies. 
and then the stuff crashes, the power goes off. Does the power ever go off here? That's a silly question, isn't it? The power was off like 10 minutes before class for like yeah. two hours. Yeah, so this, <laughs> this happens wherever you have power outages. How do you solve that problem Whether well, there is a way to handle this? Um, I don't want you to worry about knowing all this and that the operating system should have subroutines and internal API calls to handle this. They shouldn't. Normally these are best covered with a RAID controller in the hardware. Hardware-based RAID controller has non-volatile RAM. That means when the power goes off, you don't lose the data. As disk reads and writes are being staged, if the power goes off, don't worry, it's still in the non-volatile RAM. You turn the server back on and away you go and you don't lose anything. Remember this, if you're doing RAID, always, 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 if you can, do hardware and not software. If you do the SW software RAID controller, they don't have this option. They're a cheap date. They're much more cost effective. They'll save you about $250 when you're buying a server and you'll have a chance to add the hardware RAID controller or you can save $250 to get the software RAID controller. And somebody in your organization is gonna tell you, you don't have the extra $250 to do it right. And I want you to tell them if they want to forfeit their evenings or their weekends and not have family time. Because if, if you get a RAID controller, you're gonna be thinking, oh, this is cool, except it's not a full blown RAID controller. It doesn't have the extra processor. It runs off the CPU on the server. So it's actually, there's overhead. It's slowing down the server. No, you don't want a RAID controller that runs in software because it slows down the host system and takes up CPU cycles. Worse, it uses RAM as in regular RAM as in volatile RAM on the server. So when the power goes, you lose everything. It's not good. It's the worst $250 you will ever save. Gotta say it, okay? Any questions about hardware versus software controllers? Just remember a hardware solution is always worth it. Okay. So the RAID 4, I don't know why they even go into RAID 4. RAID 4 is like a, oh, we ought to think about using parity. So if we have a bad disk or data sector, we need redundancy. And so we'll use parity. So we'll do this strange strategy, except nobody uses RAID 4. And I don't even know why they're covering it here. I don't want you to know about it. I do want you to know about, and, and see, they go into such examples with this. And I'm like, oh, come on, quit wasting our time. Nobody does RAID 4. I mean, in theory, Yes, in theory, this is an operating systems course and somebody could design an operating system that loves RAID 4. Nobody does it because it's not as good. Here's why. RAID 5 is parity RAID, which allows you to keep an extra disk for parity. It's an invisible disk. You have to have, all right, so if you're gonna do RAID 1, you have to have disks in pairs. You can use however many disks you want for RAID 0. And the more disks you have, the faster and faster you go. So if you have a RAID 0 stripe and you have four disks versus a RAID 0 stripe with two disks, that RAID 4, that RAID 0 four disk stripe is twice as fast as the, it's twice as fast as the two pair, I mean the one pair. So the one pair RAID 0 set is is not you get faster and faster and, and you don't have to have pairs you don't have to have even numbers of disks for raid zero the only thing you don't have is redundancy so if you lose any one of the drives you lose everything and that's not good so you get lots of performance but no redundancy raid one you have to have pairs of disks two four six eight if you're going to do a raid one array and raid five you do however many you want, plus an extra one for parity, and then there's an extra parity bit or byte, depending on the size of the disk sectors, right? There's parity data that is isolated and separated and stored on the separate disk. So there's a set of parity data on the extra disk, and there's an additional copy of parity data, a partial set of parity data, let's repeat that, a partial set of parity data 
stretched across the three disks, and that means mathematically speaking, it is less likely to lose all of your parity data. You could lose the whole disk here, but you still have a complete set of parity data between the remaining disks, which means you replace the bad parity disk. Now, what does that mean? RAID 5 is like a poor man's RAID. RAID 5 is what you do if you don't, if you don't have money. RAID 5 is what you do if you know you need RAID, but you really don't have the resources to do it right. Why am I saying that? Um, you get more volume. So when you mirror drives together, you don't get more volume. When you stripe, you get more volume. This is something that we talked about, or this is something that I mentioned um, previously. Let's go all the way back here. You have a terabyte drive, terabyte drive, terabyte drive, right? Four terabyte drives. In a RAID zero configuration, that's a four terabyte volume that's sitting on top. It's a fake logical disk, right? You have terabyte, 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 physical one terabyte drives. You end up with a four terabyte volume. So you get lots of capacity and lots of performance. Um, I'm not gonna say that you get reliability except for the fact that you're splitting the workload between four disks so the wear out time is one quarter so technically there is some better reliability but just because teaming the workload across disks splits the workload across disks and it's not as bad on one disk so that's technically true but not not really okay uh, when you do a raid one solution if i had four disks and i formed a RAID 1 mirror with four disks, I'd have a two terabyte set and a two terabyte mirror. So I cut my disk capacity in half. So if I get redundancy, the problem is I lose capacity. If I go from four terabytes to two terabytes, does everybody understand the trade-off there? Kind of, sort of? Uh, it's, it's between, you said if I, I have the capacity, I double the performance, right? Well, yeah. So if you're doing a RAID 0, a stripe, it's all about performance and capacity. So you have four separate physical disks. You stitch them together on a fake logical disk. This, has, this one volume has four terabytes, and it's four times as fast as one of these by itself. Got it? Yeah, got it. Okay, so let's take the RAID mirror situation. The RAID mirror has to mirror copies of data. So if you have four total disks, you can build a mirror between a pair of disks and a pair of disks. Or you can, you can have a mirror here and here and that's your C drive and a mirror one here and here and that's your D drive. But you can do mirrors with pairs of disks, right? So how much disk capacity do you really have? Well, I have the same disk basically as this disk, which means I have two copies of data. So I really only have one terabyte of data here, and I really only have one terabyte of data here. I have a C drive that's redundant as heck, and it's fast when it's reading, but it's not fast when it's writing and I have half the capacity. So if I take the same four disks and use a RAID 1 solution, I cut the total disk capacity in half because I'm, I'm storing extra copies on those extra disks in the event that one of them blows up, okay? Now, why do we do RAID 5? Remember I said it's the poor man's RAID? <clears throat> poor man's RAID. So when you're doing RAID 5, what you're really doing is saying, okay, I don't have money for real RAID, so I'm gonna use RAID 5. And RAID 5 gives you a lot of capacity. So RAID 5 gives you, I don't like these slides. The most important thing to remember about RAID 5 is that it gives you lots of capacity, so you have Let's say we have four terabyte disks, right? And this is the parity disk off the, it's off the screen. You don't see it on screen, but take the same four disks. This is RAID 5. 
I have the first physical disc, the second physical disc, the third physical disc, and I have the fourth one that's used for parity. I have three discs that are used for data. So there is some striping, there is some mirroring, but I have to have parity to make that work. So I have a three terabyte volume. I have more capacity. I have some redundancy. So I have, I have redundancy, I have more capacity. But what I have is this really weird thing where the parity data is split between the disks and the separate parity disks. So whenever I'm reading and writing to the set, I have to put a parity, I have to put parity data on these three disks and I also have to put parity data here. There's a lot of processing overhead with RAID 5. It's slower. And this author thinks that, um, well, basically what you get is you say that uh, RAID 5 is, all right, so here's, here's the last slide. RAID 0 is always fastest, has the best capacity. We've already talked about that, yes? Yeah, we did. Okay. And RAID 1 is mirrored. So when it comes to sequential workloads, if you have a long steady write and you have a pair of disks working in tandem, it's faster write than five. Okay. So it well, actually I'm gonna I'm gonna switch that. So it's saying because of the raid that RAID 5 works, it's better than RAID 1 for sequential workloads. And then it's saying RAID 1 is better than RAID 5 for random workloads. I, I don't agree with that. After 20 years in industry and data, and I've worked in data centers all the time, okay? I'm telling you that in theory, our author is worthy of respect. He has a PhD in computer science and especially happens to be operating systems. And disk IO is a big deal in operating systems. And so I'm gonna pay the man his respect and his wife, both are posse do so professors, husband and wife, world renowned, right, at a, at a world class school for computer engineering. Those are the people who wrote your textbook. Okay. That said, I'm going to tell you that the theory goes to the, it just goes in the trash can. Okay. Here's the deal. If you got to have fast and performance and capacity and you have a good way of backing up your data, go rate zero. If you need redundancy because you you want to have a fail safe in case a disk goes bad, use RAID 1, okay? Don't ever use RAID 5 unless you have no choice because RAID 5 isn't good for any workloads. That's just wrong, wrong, wrong. RAID 5, I mean, I know what he's saying here and in theory, what he's saying is accurate and correct in theory but I've seen 20 years of RAID 5 implementations on RAID controllers, and in practice, it's not like theory. RAID 5 is a dog. It's, your, it's like the ugly cousin you don't wanna end up marrying because you're stranded on, on a desert island. RAID 5, avoid RAID 5. Just, I mean, surely don't do JBOD, but you know, if, if you can't do anything other than RAID, I mean, if the only choice you have for RAID is RAID 5, it's better than nothing. Okay. Now, why am I saying that? Because you can buy disk appliances, you can buy uh, network attached storage appliances online at Newegg and have 10 terabytes of disk space that your family shares with the wireless, right? And if you look under the hood, it's RAID 5. And it's redundant and uh, you know, if a disc goes bad, you have time to replace it. But if you lose more than one disc, you lose everything. So it's not that redundant. And the overhead to split the parity data across three different discs and then on the parity disc itself, the overhead is terrible. Reading and writing, people do RAID 5 volumes because they want the maximum amount of volume, but they also want redundancy. So the uninformed, unprofessional computer scientist or IT person tries to run virtual machines off of RAID 5, and here's where your author falls short. The best RAID of all is a combination of RAID 1 and RAID 0. It's called RAID 1-0.
it is striped with mirroring. You get the best of both without the disadvantages of either. The only catch is you cut your disc capacity in half because you're doing a mirror. How do you stripe and mirror? You need a minimum of four, you need even numbers of drives and you need a minimum of four discs. But what you have is super fast and it's super redundant and there's no overhead and it just works. And it's awesome. And if you run virtual machines and you have a system that has a RAID 1.0 RAID array with a hardware controller and non-volatile memory, you're gonna run 10 times faster on your boots and your screen refreshes and your performance on every one of those virtual machines. And the truth is somebody's gonna to try to sell RAID 5 because they come from, you know, a fancy schmancy education, you know, an institution of higher education, never spent time in a data center, learned the theory and not the real world. I want you to be educated. RAID 5 is the red headed stepchild the ugly cousin you don't want to marry. If you can't do anything else, then RAID 5 is better than nothing. RAID 5 is better than JBOD. JBOD is worse than just using regular separate disks. Don't ever do JBOD, ever, okay? RAID 1 is the best way to go for operating system volumes when you're installing the operating system. If you have high performance needs, go RAID 1.0. Okay, now uh, we've beat up RAID pretty much. Are there any other questions about RAID before we close RAID? And that's that's the unofficial, unedited, bootleg version of how to survive in the gritty world of RAID. Always get a hardware controller. Learn how to use the hardware controller. Yeah. Learn how to use the hot swap thing. That's what you need to do. And always, always buy extra discs when you're doing RAID. Don't ever forget that. Okay, so that's how you stay out of trouble. Any questions on RAID? Going once, going twice? None from me. Not from me. Okay, good. All right, so yeah, I am keeping some quick notes in this other thing. Uh, I'll finish, as we finish the review of the other slides, I'm gonna add the last little bit of notes and I'll push it out and then you have to have the assessment done before the start of class Thursday and the rest of the assignments and assessments done before the end of the week. So file system, right? Some of this is, um, some of this we've already been through, but I just want to see if there's something we needed to circle back around to take a closer look at in lecture 17. Oh yeah, here we go. So when we're talking about the IO continuum, and we're talking about file names, the thing that I want you to understand is that in a domain or enterprise environment like Active Directory, the path also includes the name of the machine depending on the application. So the operating system extensions to the operating system and APIs for the operating system know how to map machine names along with the path of logical volumes and network volumes. I'm talking about network maps. Everybody knows what I mean when I say network maps? I'm going, I'm going to map a network drive, backslash, backslash, server name, backslash. Yes. Okay, that's called a UNC. A UNC, I don't want to get this wrong. Universal Naming Convention. Okay, so if you get on YouTube or you start hitting Wikipedia's, they get into some weirdness. Universal Naming Convention. This is an old uh, legacy, always dates all the way back to Unix, but it's used heavily in Microsoft Active Directory NTFS domains. It's part of that whole um, compliance thing that we talked about in the last module. 
in order to be compliant. Uh, interoperable. So UNC. Another way is URLs. Everybody knows what a URL is, right? Yes. Yeah, uniform resource located. Right. So I want you to be aware that a file name path when you're working, when you're extending the file IO in an enterprise environment, remember that your operating system has to include longer names. It used to be that you could only have 256 characters in the full file name and path. And the old versions of operating systems like DOS and the first versions of Linux, there was a length limitation. Technically speaking, you're supposed to go a lot, you're supposed to be able to go a lot longer now. Uh, I think 200, did I say 256? Anyway, there's, you can have very long names now. And, um, but it is still best not to have spaces in your file names. Everybody knows not to have spaces in your file names if you can help it, right? Yes. Okay. And we all know what inodes are, right? Yep. Okay. So one of the things that we want to cue you into Indexing, all right, so this is, when we talk about extending file system IO, we're not just talking about Active Directory and enterprise environments, but we're also talking about the resilience of the operating system. You want to be able to index the files that you store, and that index also has to do with data recovery, right, and logging. It's, uh, it's called auditing. So if you see the word audit, it means log. And, and that's, uh, yeah, we'll get into that in a minute. But anyway, I want you to know that indexing is an, a very important aspect of the file system if you want to have additional enhancements such as logging or auditing and uh, superior data recovery when something goes boom. Okay. So. Yeah. So just remember indexing. And that was slide number six. Okay. Uh, APIs. So this is read, write, seek. It has to do with uh, string. I think we started looking at some of this before in our previous module. Didn't we go over like directory, tree, child? Yeah, we did all that. Okay, so here it's showing you how the data, the, the file name and path map to the inode locations. Unless, of course, your disk is very fragmented, it's not as neat and clean as it's showing here. What's my point? Um, if you ever thought that disk defragmentation was important, it, it is so important you should set a timer for yourself, and if you work as a professional in data science, in computer science, in information technology, in cybersecurity. If you don't defragment your disk drives and run maintenance on your system once a week, you're not gonna have a life. Okay, just saying. All right, we know about Mkdir and how you create directories and all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't think there's much here we have to worry about. Indexing open, yeah, code, I don't read, write, close, closing a file. So yeah, closing a file is one of those things. You will often see references, so this is file 33, um, slide 33. You'll often see references to poorly written programs that don't return zero. They don't clear out the memory registers. Does everybody understand what I'm saying when I talk about that? Um, I guess you could maybe just explain it a little bit. Okay, let's say that you reserve a lot of variables resources in a program and half the time they're never used, but you declare your variables and you actually store default values in them. And then instead of doing a, a best practice when you're, and this is, this is not true for every, okay, so I'm gonna, I better offer a caveat here. Not for every programming language do you have to worry about uh, taking out the trash, but it's generally considered a best practice in your coding methods 
for some programming languages to return zero right before you properly close out of your program. And what that does is it, it clears the reserved memory addresses so that other programs don't get stomped on or stepped on so they behave better so you have a more stable environment. And that's, that has to do with memory management. We'll probably get into that a whole lot more in the next module. In the file IO persistence arena, a best practice is, you know, everybody's all about opening, reading, and writing. And very few people take the time to pay attention to this last little piece. It's like, oh, come on, don't, don't leave your car door open in the parking lot. Close your car door and lock it for crying out loud, right? That's what doing file API without the close is. It's a best practice. It really helps keep files, well, degradation and corruption to a minimum. And if you're ever working in file API circles, just remember that this is another, considered another best practice. You want to pay attention to how file read and write operations are terminated and closed. Does that make sense? Because otherwise, otherwise your business is like half open and half finished and then somebody powers off their machine and you know, you know. Have you ever opened up your laptop and you're like, oh, you had a file open, but now it's a temporary file. Do you want to recover this temporary file? Have you ever seen anything like that? Yes. Yeah. That's because when you go to sleep, the power management routine doesn't trigger the right close, doesn't trigger the right operations on the file API, and that's it's buggy. So that's that's like a finer point of file I.O. I thought we would share on slide 33. Okay. And, all right. So there is no system call for deleting files, right? So when you're deleting files, the thing, oh, okay. So this is something that we should probably discuss because I don't think we emphasized it very much in our previous module. Did you know that when you delete a file, you're not really like overwriting random ones and zeros. You're just removing the file name so the file system can't find it anymore. The file's still there. You do know that if you delete a file, it is still on the disk. All we did was remove the first character of the file name. So now the file system can't find it anymore, but it's still there. Does everybody know that? Yes. Yes. See this right here? FDs are deleted when close or process quits, right? So this, this business about, hey, take out the trash, practice, do best practices, right? Yeah, so once again, close, close, right? So deleting files, there is no system. All we do is remove the first letter of the file name. Now the file system doesn't know where it is. New files are written on top of it, right? And sometimes when you have file fragments and file um, instabilities and corruption, it's because this closing process, the file IO wasn't properly managed. So that's significant. So here you're seeing it again. And Slide 34. All right, network file system designers. Oh, this is the cool stuff, right? So when you're talking about network file systems, we're talking about NFS, we're talking about uh, NAS, network attached storage. And go ahead. Did you have a question? thing that you should remember is that the disk doesn't reside on uh, the file does not reside this is the links demonstrate okay so with network file systems one of the important concepts is that your data file does not live on a local disk and in order to broker access to that disk file that resides or lives somewhere on some other system on a local disk that belongs to that other system, you have to have a mechanism or method 
to make uh, file name access transparent across network file systems. Does that make sense? It's not really there. Yeah, it does. Yeah, a network file is not really there. It belongs to some other system somewhere else. So how do you make that work? You, you have this whole family of methods in network file system and network attached storage and all that, where there are links that help extend the file IO. And I just want you to be aware of that. That's on slide 36. Okay. Um, main disk backup disk. I think they're talking about backups. Uh, many file systems approach. So typically speaking, if you have lots of different file systems, you want lowest common denominators. The thing I want you to understand is that, has, has anyone heard of FAT? File allocation table? Anyone? Yes, I think so. Okay. So do you remember when I created a virtual hard disk and then I formatted it? Yes. Okay, so I attached a disk and I formatted it. And, and when I went to format it, let's see if I can attach. Can I attach this VHD? Where can I find it? Yeah. Uh, let's do the little one, the USB, right? So if I do this, oh, now I have a sand disk. So if you were with me in 343 or 345 in forensics, uh, if I format this, NTFS is the industrial strength Windows file system that has all the built-in extra indexing and auditing and resilience and dynamic disk capabilities and, 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 and. EXTF4 is the Linux enhanced file system. But if you want to interoperate between file systems, you want to use something like FAT32 or what's the other FAT file system that everybody's so jazzed about? I know one of the two of you know. NTFS? Nope, it's not NTFS. EXT4? Nope. Nope. All right, I'll start. I'm guessing. Um, EXT fat, EX fat. So you have file allocation table file systems. Those were the original DOS file system. 16 is 16 bit. So you have disks that can range to a certain size. 32 bit allows four four gigabyte volumes, not very large, right? When you think about it. I think FAT32 goes larger. What's the file size limit? What's the volume? Thirty-two gigs. Yeah, that's not a very big that's not a very big partition size, is it? I mean, that's a thumb drive. Really. Yeah, that's a thumb drive, right? Remember, we used to use floppy disks, this thing called floppy disk, okay? And, all right, so how do you bypass the four gigabyte limitations? So if you want to, on a physical, so this is the partition size limit, but then you have a four gigabyte limitation on FAT32 that has to do with the physical size of the disk, right? have to play games, but EX, the point I'm trying to make is EXT fat or EX fat. That's another flavor of, that's like the Linux version or Mac version of fat. So if you want to interoperate between operating systems, you want to, you want to work in an environment with many file systems, you have to have like a common denominator. The problem is when you use FAT, it's old school. It's like old floppy disk. A lot of the indexing, a lot of the enhanced features are not there. So when you copy data files onto volumes that are universally accessible between different types of operating systems and can be read by different operating systems, 
FAT can be read by any operating system. NTFS cannot be read by a system that's running DOS with FAT as a file system. It doesn't know what NTFS is. It can't read Macs. It can't read Linux volumes. Linux volumes can read anybody, including NTFS, which I find kind of disturbing. So can Macs. If you want to work in cyber, one of the coolest reasons to own a Mac is because the disk management utility in Macs also talks universally to anybody. But old school, if you have to make things work, go file allocation table for a file system type. Okay. Oh yeah. And so it's talking about mounting the volumes. You have to mount volumes for disks. This is something I think we covered in our last module. We're talking about disks, right? You have to mount disks. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. It just means you have to connect them in Linux. You can't just access them where in Windows they're already connected with a drive letter. 